So we're going to talk tonight about price outlook. And I'm going to have the amazing task of trying to help you figure out what's going to happen over the next five years. you believe that? An economist, five years. That probably won't be very good. You want to get started with our exercises again? Uh, where are my row crop producers? Wheat? Oh, more hands. Cattle. Liars. There's more of you out there. I know there is. <laughs> There's just a few hands going up. I know everybody has cattle. That's how we make money in this, in this great state. <laughs> I don't know what those murmurings were, but we'll go with it. You want some? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Back on topic. What's our main task in this farm bill? Why are you here? Make a decision. Why is this decision important to you? What is the farm bill to you? Risk management. Do you feel like your risk was managed in the last farm bill? What was wrong with it if you didn't? I'm a thought-provoking kind of guy. Did it pay enough? Did it pay on time? Did you like the program you were in? Or did you want the other one? I wanted which one paid the most? Was that? Yeah. It becomes a game of trying to pick the most free money. That doesn't sound like risk management to me. That sounds like we're hoping that we got lucky. And that is the struggle with, these, with this decision. You got one program, ART. It's a revenue-based product. You know, it pays if yields go down or price goes down. It's, it's revenue. What does that sound like? What do most of you carry on your crops as your main risk management tool? Crop insurance. You guys are so much better than that at last meeting I was at. It took them forever to make that answer. Crop insurance is your major risk management tool, right? Don't forget it. The farm bill will be a supplement to that, as you already know. So we think about what gives us the most risk management, what gives us the biggest chance of succeeding. In the last farm bill, a lot of producers were interested in Art County. Revenue-based, county-wide trigger product. Why were most people interested in that product? Think back, remember. Did we have a guaranteed payment the first year? Pretty good idea we were going to have a second guaranteed payment. And that thought and that money, that bird in the hand, overshadowed pretty much all other thoughts about risk management. And who can blame you? Guaranteed money, hard to pass that up. What was the other question we asked? Where did we think wheat prices were gonna go in the last farm bill? What are the chances the wheat price will go below 550? And there was a resounding, not a chance. Because Oklahoma producers will lose money. They won't be able to grow wheat at 550. Well, guess what, the world doesn't care if we make money. Think about that. So what's your biggest risk? The last few years have exposed many of our major risks on our operations, haven't they? Deep price losses have proved to be almost impossible to overcome. We've had some good growing years. We've raised some really good yields, but selling big yields at low prices isn't fun. And then if you have the bad year, the low yields and the low price, it's hard to overcome that. Looking at, stay in front of the microphone here. Looking at the next farm bill, what do we expect to happen? Are there a lot of people interested in PLC? A, ra a short raise of hands and so no one sees you? Okay, that was a joke, come on. 
This 2018-2019 marking your average price is 516. The 2019-2020 price is estimated at 458. How does PLC make payments? It takes the difference between the reference price at 550 and the marketing year average price. So with an estimated price for 2019 and 2020 at 458, that's nearly a dollar, right? And it's fluctuated around that. And the reason it's fluctuating is if you can see the estimated marketing year average price, and this is information from Kansas State University, really enjoy their publications that they put out with this estimate. Looking at wheat, marketing year average or the marketing year price goes from June to May. And in June, we have a price of 481. And these, these are all estimates, but these numbers in black are more known than the ones in red. So 481 at an estimated weight of 14. These weights over here make a big difference because that's when wheat is sold in the US. If wheat isn't sold, a price wouldn't go into this calculation. So it's the amount of wheat that's actually sold. So in June, we have a weight of 14. July, a weight of 17.9. August is 13.6. September is 9.1. October would be typically 5.8. So you can see as we get into the latter half of the marketing year, the new prices don't make much of a difference. The weights are smaller, right? So we will have more wheat sold around December and January, and that has to do probably with tax management strategies and determining when they want to receive income from this crop. But with that estimated price at 458, there's going to be a similar situation as there was in the last farm bill where producers are going to think, what? We have a guaranteed payment from one of these programs hanging out here in the very first year. What's the difference between this farm bill and the next or the last one? We can change. We can change. We can chase the best program year after year after year, which is going to be good for me because I'll have a lot of meetings like this, and it won't just be the first one and then have to wait five years until we do it again. But the first two years you sign up, you're locked in. So if you got two years at the very beginning we're making a decision for. Earlier this year, think about in June when we started tracking prices, 481 for wheat. When you start getting into this territory above 450, you get 481 closer to 5, the PLC payments aren't nearly as dramatic as they are whenever we're down at 450, right? And there's various things that caused prices to go down throughout this year, but if we would have backed up and did this meeting back last January, I don't think this decision would have been nearly as clear because wheat prices were higher and they were closer to 550 than they are right now. Starting some of my outlook talk, this is a graph of Chicago wheat and blue, Kansas City wheat and black, and corn prices there in yellow. So if you go back in time, we see that wheat prices on the board were 550, you subtract your basis off of that and you get your cash price. But wheat prices were doing pretty well earlier in the year, and then they started falling off. We went through time like that for a while. Various things in the world were causing this to happen. Fundamental information, some trade news, different things were occurring to cause us to go down. One of the major problems we're having in the wheat market is being able to secure export tenders and having interest in U.S. wheat has become very difficult to find. We're just not as competitive in the world market because we aren't as close to the end markets as some of our competitors. So we see the wheat price falling and falling and falling, and something else started to occur around this time. You start seeing Chicago and KC diverge. How many of you have been following this spread? A little frustrating, isn't it? KC is supposed to be above Chicago, if anything. So again, an overabundance of, of hard red winter wheat, not being able to export it, we start seeing these markets diverge. What happened here as we get towards May and June, we saw the corn price increase. Remember? Flooding. Had a lot of flooding. Concerns about the corn crop. Not knowing if we were going to encourage the Corn Belt to continue to plant corn late into the year. So you see prices skyrocket. And this is a very good view of marketing and thinking about selling your crops before they're even planted. Right? Because the market is telling us here that we really want corn, guys. Keep going. Keep going. We need you to plant corn. And as soon as they secure those bushels, what happens? The market falls down again. 
So planting corn during this time because of this price action dictated that we needed to somehow protect that price. We saw that price come down and if you start following corn, because everything starts with corn, it's kind of the, it's the baseline of these markets and it's how other feed grains are priced and corn is a lower protein than KC wheat, so KC wheat's always going to be a little bit above corn in its value because of its feed value. We see the KC wheat continue to go up with corn. We saw this, this spread shrink some. More competitiveness for KC wheat because of the rise in corn prices. And whenever corn started to fall off, we see KC come right with it and nearly touch corn on certain occasions and almost, you know, when you figure in basis, sometimes corn being worth more than KC was until we got KC wheat moving into feedlots. And then we got several feedlots in the Texas Panhandle and Oklahoma switching over completely to feeding wheat. We find a little more value for KC wheat. And as you see here, most recently, from October to November, we start to see the corn price coming down and the KC wheat price continuing up, Chicago continuing up with it. But this is an amazing spread going on right here. Almost as high as a dollar at one point, sitting somewhere around 90 today, if I remember correctly. This is not normal. And you would like to think that Chicago wheat maybe is setting the baseline of what wheat is worth in the world and what we hope to aspire to get to. It's going to take more export contracts and, and securing those export tenders to get KC wheat back up to here. All wheat goes into that marketing year average price. All classes of wheat. So as KC wheat producers in this very strange situation that we find ourselves in, are kind of losing out in that marketing year average price calculation because we're having Chicago wheat being sold at 517 going into that calculation, just like we have KC wheat being sold at 427. Make sense? Clear as mud. It's a fun time to be me, I suppose. There's a lot to talk about. Will this corn price be able to recover? We have record prevented planted acres. We don't know how this corn crop's going to really fare. We're still harvesting it. We have harvest concerns. We have colder weather than expected. It's taking forever to get the corn market out or the corn crop out. What would you expect that to do to prices? You expect it to go up. What's it doing? The opposite. <laughs> Why? And that's the struggle as farmers as we try to we face these things. And, and all the fundamentals and everything that we know in our backyard is telling us that prices should be going up and they do the opposite. Again, price risk is something we just cannot control. And a lot of it we don't understand. And so much of it is based off what is happening in the world and not what is happening at home that it continues to be one of our major concerns and volatility is another major concern for us. We get a signal here that we need to be planting more corn and then that price just falls away very quickly. More and more effort is going to have to be thrown at this, this marketing question and how we secure our prices because if we make these decisions that yes, I'll plant corn at 450 and now it's 368, it's a very different world we're in and we don't even have the crop out yet. So think about these things moving forward as you try to make your decision and I'll give arguments on both sides about what program could be best. The farther west I go, the more difficult the situation gets because the way these programs make payments, PLCs, the difference between the reference price and the marketing year average price multiplied by your FSA program yield. Anybody know their yields for their farms? Some of you may have 50, you may have 40, you may have 30. I get to Woodward, we start talking 20. Whenever you get program yields down around 20 or 25, somewhere in there is a sweet spot. PLC program or PLC payments are fairly close to what ARC payments can be. Now, if price falls completely away, we know that PLC payments don't get capped. ARC payments get capped, correct? 10% of the benchmark revenue. PLC payments cannot be capped. They will go all the way till we get to the loan rate, and then the loan rate takes over, and we keep getting protected below that. 
So PLC is a deep loss coverage option. It protects against these incredible losses in prices that we see. We were able, a very good thing in this farm bill, and I will keep singing these praises, is we got to keep 550 as our reference price for wheat, which is a very good thing. So when it comes down to trying to choose the program, and I can't make this decision for you, but the more analysis I do and the more I look at these calculations, it it's a, has a big determining factor is going to be your FSA program yield. And Dr. Hagerman will talk some more about the tool and, and how we can try to calculate future payments and scenarios and things like that. And that, that yield will be very important in that, in that calculation and trying to make your decision. But as I go across the state, farther east with better FSA program yield or FSA or PLC yields on our farms, it tends to be that PLC can make big payments. It doesn't take nearly as big of a drop in price to equal ARC payments. As you go west, it doesn't become so clear. But then there is this other side of it. How many of you plant wheat and only wheat? Probably pretty good, honest answer. We have a lot of diversification now, don't we? And that's one of the things we've done to combat low wheat prices is to diversify. Well, if I'm only getting paid on low wheat prices through PLC, what does that do to the risk management portfolio on my farm? What do you think? It's a good thing I'm not in radio because dead air is not good. <laughs> well, if the wheat price goes down and I'm planning Milo, is my Milo protected by PLC? Maybe. KC wheat follows corn pretty close at current levels. So maybe wheat can be considered a feed grain at some times, especially at current price levels. So other feed grains could, some of that price movement in those crops could be captured. But it's a proxy at best, and it's not perfect. Look at the other side. If I enroll my wheat in Art County, it's a revenue-based product. It can pay if yields are bad or if price is bad. And say I have a really dry spring that causes my wheat crop to be poor. Does a dry spring affect my summer crops? It could. So you can kind of start to make the argument, well, if I have wheat base acres and I plant a lot of row crops, maybe a dry winter that would hurt wheat would also affect my spring crops and maybe Art County would be a good option for that. I have a lot of ideas here <laughs> that I'm trying to, trying to walk you through when you make these decisions. And our time together is short, so I need to move on to cattle. But as you make these decisions and you, and you think about it, go back to what are my FSA program yields, if they're very strong, if they're you know, 35, 40, 45, you're going to start to think about it doesn't take as big of a marketing your average price loss to equal what an ARC payment could maximum be because it's capped at 10% of the benchmark revenue. If you have low pro program yields, you can think about, well, maybe these would be good farms to put in ARC because then I get some of that revenue protection. And if prices go up in the next few years, then I will be protected if I lose yield. So some different things to think about moving on. Cattle market dynamics. Are cattle markets dynamic? They've been fun. Yeah, or not. Either way you look at it. Very jittery and defensive. A lot of this has come from production concerns in the supply chain with this Tyson plant fire. Have heard news that that's going to come back online. I have a whole presentation on some of those numbers. What happened, we would expect to happen here regardless of what you think about price movement. Because you think about a middle supply chain disruption and the product going to that plant no longer has a home and the product that comes out of that plant is going to be in less supply, you would expect the price action that you saw due to that fire. Now, some of the price movement and the amount that that price moved 
hurt a lot of our producers, especially if the cattle weren't hedged. And again, that talks about market uncertainty and protecting against that risk. Some of the things we really got to think about in the future. Looking back in time for cattle, we've got feeder cattle here going all the way back two years. January of 18 is over here on the left side. This is live cattle. Just kind of look at the spread between these two markets. Uh-oh, uh advanced too far there. Look at the spread between these two markets and kind of how prices are reacting. Saw this live cattle price go way down here and these big price movements around the fire time and now we've seen prices recover and we've completely blown past where we were before the fire and markets have recovered and we're, and we're chugging right along. Pretty good things now as we've gotten past that market and gotten through that market uncertainty. Who grazes wheat in here? One, two guys. Three. Three guys. And you know, that's been tough this year. You look at some of the mesonet data and the growing degree days we've had, about 70% of what's normal. That's kind of why our wheat isn't growing like we expect it to. Been talking for many years that we haven't had a winter. Well, it's here. And it's, oh, I don't like the results at all. This is a graph of March feeder cattle going back a year. We had that peak there after March and in May. If you had graze out cattle, you did really well. We saw the market fall off. This is a 52 week average here in the purple at 141.83. And we got the 52 week high, not perfectly represented here. Some of this has to do with the way it calculates it and using nearby contracts instead of long term contracts. So we see a little bit of a different marketing channel represented here. But we get prices coming above this midpoint at 141, 142 in here. And we continue to see this strength. And we saw there's a 10 day moving average in the green and a 20 day in the orange. And we saw that get a little wide here, which is concerning because you go back in time and you see when it gets wide that the market likes to make corrections. Well, it corrected and then continued right on going. And now we've, we've got that 10 day moving average up around 146 spread getting really wide. So we see this big correction coming down. Currently trading at 143, prices are pretty good. We're still trading above that 52-week marketing channel. Things are cooking pretty well. This used to be resistance here. Prices didn't want to move through it, and now it's become support, and prices don't want to go below it. If I'm buying cattle right now, I'm pretty concerned. I want to get those hedged, because look at where prices can go. We've got a bottom down here somewhere around 126, 127. Got to be highly concerned that you could see prices fall to there. A put option at current prices could be somewhere between five or six bucks. So you think about coming down to 138 as being your protected price after you purchase that put. You know, you're protecting at least eight bucks here before prices are really going to find support in the current market. Not too bad of a product to purchase or look at livestock risk protection to get some of those cattle hedged. If you were lucky enough after the fire, you thought the price action was not right and it was overreaction, you could have bought calls here and rode that market up and took advantage of some of that value different marketing strategies again that we always have to be thinking about and the ways we can take advantage of it. If you were able to buy your wheat pasture cattle down here, you're sitting really pretty right now. This is seasonal price action in cattle markets and I don't have a whole lot of time to look at that, but I will just kind of go through, you know, you got our 475 pounders in blue here at their least valuable in October and jumping way up here in November. So your cow calf producer, you like to sell some of your heavy, or your weaning calves at this time of year, as you know, in Oklahoma, we see that big jump in demand for wheat pasture cattle, not as big this year because we're having trouble getting wheat pasture out of the ground. But you continue to see that continue up through the springtime, getting really high here, almost 5% above where they were in January is their starting point. And then we'll see some of our calves coming off of wheat. We've got 775 pounders here. They peak in July. So, you know, you see some of that price action continue to increase through graze out. And looking at the green line at 875 pounders where we see those peak in July and August. So thinking about marketing those animals and when, when you want to be buying and selling, it's kind of useful information here to look at some of these charts every once in a while and see how prices react in your, in your backyard. All right, so this is going back to October 25th, and I chose not to update this because this is looking at value again in that current market, and that's when a lot of our cattle were bought or around that time. Some of that purchasing is tap tapering off, at least in my neck of the woods. So we see, you know, putting 200 pounds on a 400 pound animal in that market on October 25th was worth $1.17 per pound. You come out here to 550 pounder, we see $1.40. 
you know, some, some good buys out here in these heavier animals during this time. A lot of, lot of a good profit potential, actually, whenever you start looking at these little heavier animals out here with these $1.39, $1.32 value of gains. All right, so the marginal wheat production cost of grazing, this is something that Dr. Peel and I worked on is a little bit of a marginal budget of what it costs to actually produce wheat for whether you're grazing it yourself or bringing in gain cattle. Lose about six bushels per acre and value that at 450, which is probably optimistic at this point. We get 27 bucks for the, co for the cost of that yield loss. Fertilizer, an extra 30 pounds at 42 cents per pound of actual in is 1260. Fertilizer application costing five bucks. Army worms, if you had wheat pasture, you probably had to spray for army worms. You got 10 bucks there. Seed, an extra bushel at $10 is 10 bucks. Additional cost per acre of 64.90. All right, so whenever this budget was made, we look at, and it was back in September whenever we were doing this, look at a 475 pound beginning weight at that time with a 1.19 acres per head stocking rate, you got 26 cents per pound of gain cost. That's what it's costing to feed those animals. So if you're getting cattle in on gain, whatever that number happens to be, using this marginal budget, just these costs, you'd be covered if you were receiving 26 cents. At a 575 pounder and 625, the respective numbers are 31 and 34. Now you have more uh, care you have to put on top of that you, most of the time if you're watching the animals or other things or providing mineral. So you have to add some more cost in here that we have not included. But there were decent profit opportunities out there for grazing cattle if you were able to get the wheat pasture in. Looking at just a budget here for winter stockers, running them from November 1st to February 28th, purchasing 475 pounders at 150, and then you got your gaining two and a half pounds, which is low for probably most of you. You would expect to gain somewhere around three or three and a half. You got 4% death loss, $25 per head vet med. $12 per head, another cost, 6% interest. We get down selling a 773 pounder after 120 days, your break even price would be 125 bucks. But you go to that feeder cattle market, and I was showing you, you know, protecting some of that with put options, we're probably able to cover that pretty easily as long as we can keep those animals alive and have a, a normal death loss. Raising that price to 166 per hundred weight brings that break even price to 135. All right, that's what I had prepared. If you have other questions or want some clarification on what I talked about, I'd be glad to take a few minutes to do that. Any thoughts? Yes, sir. What about coal cow prices? What do you expect? What about coal cow prices? What do I expect coal cow prices to do? I think about what are coal cow prices telling me right now? And that market has been telling us that our cattle inventory numbers are about where they need to be or need to start going down. What's interesting about that question with those animals in the near term, probably going to stay close to where they're at, at least till we get to spring. I wouldn't expect to see a big run going into the winter time. But as we get to spring, think about what's happening in the world fundamentally. We got African swine fever and, and reduction in pork supplies are going to be huge. So what other meats are going to make up that? that value or that that protein supply beef has the potential to do that and however long that market is affected and how long that's prolonged the cattle market could get a signal that we may need to either increase numbers or at least stay where we are could find some value for those animals currently I don't you know in the next few months or at least till spring I don't see a whole lot out there that's going to make those things worth a whole lot more it's pretty hard to feed a cow through the winter and make money, but if you have access to some cheaper feed, it can be done. We just, you know, we look at some of OSU's research, doing it in a dry lot can be pretty difficult if you're starting with cattle in good condition. If they're, if they're very thin, you can put some condition on them relatively easily, they, that could make you money. Other questions? I will say this, I'm not too worried about this farm bill. One, it stayed pretty much the same, didn't it? Not a lot changed. You'll learn more as we go on through the meeting. I know I'm the first one here. But we know a lot about this farm bill because it's pretty similar to the last one. We only have to make a decision for the first two years. We already talked about our major risk management program is going to be crop insurance. Okay, so you think about these programs, you make a selection. If they pay, they pay what? About a year after the crop was lost. <laughs> And that's been some of the struggle with, the, with some of this risk management. So don't stress. 
Don't worry about it too much. All right? There is going to be some of this you know, first decision here this first year. PLC could look like a pretty good option for some of us. We get the change after two years, so maybe going after that money in the very first election isn't going to be long-term effects for us and going to hurt us too bad. But do consider some of what I talked about earlier with your program yields. Find out what they are, how big they are, and then we can run some of that information through the tool and kind of give you an idea of what price has to do in order to make and what the two programs will pay with that price action and yield, yield movements. So 